Wonderful. So welcome everyone to our fifth uh, Women in Neurosurgery series. We've had a star lineup and we're so delighted and honored to have uh, Professor Sheila Singh with us today. Uh, Professor Singh has been an inspiration as a neurosurgeon scientist uh, really since her PhD work in Toronto where she published her landmark study that led to identification of uh, cancer stem cells and brain tumors in each year 2004. I think it's cited close to 9,000 times. So um, she's been doing incredible work since. And uh, one of the again, missions that we have at CAMSIN is to show really inspiring role models, people who do incredible work here in Canada and uh, uh, getting everyone a chance to really get to know these people, both on a professional level and also about their career trajectory. So we're really delighted that, that Professor Singh has been with the city and this will be a subdivision of the talk. Uh, without further ado, I will pass it on to my colleagues, Mohamed Pedram to introduce the speaker for this evening. Absolutely. Um, so we are very, very happy and very excited to have Dr. Uh, Singh join us today. Um, Dr. Shayla Singh is, the, is currently the Chief Pediatric Neurosurgeon at McMaster Children's Hospital and Professor of Surgery and Biochemistry. She is Division Head of Neurosurgery at Hamilton Health Sciences and the inaugural Director of McMaster's New Cancer Research Center, uh, Center for Discovery in Cancer Research. She holds a Tier 1 uh, Senior Canada Research Chair in Human Brain Cancer Stem Cell Biology and is Director of the Ma uh, McMaster Surgeon Scientist Program, which is part of McMaster's pre-established clinical investigator program that provides research training for surgical residents. Since 2007, Dr. Shayla's lab, um, Dr. Shayla Singh's lab uh, uh, applies the developmental neurobiology framework to the study of brain tumorogenesis, building upon previous cell culture techniques developed for the isolation of normal neural stem cells and applying them to brain tumors and through development uh, of a xenograft model to effect efficiently study brain tumors initiating cells, which is known as BI BTIC. Um, Dr. Singh's lab uh, aims to understand the molecular mechanism that governs BTIC self renewal. So, Dr. Singh, um, we are very happy to have you in, in Camp Science Night. So, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Mohammed Saman and Pedram, for the invitation to speak here tonight and also for that lovely introduction. It's really nice to be here with you guys um, and to see all of your energy and your enthusiasm and your interest. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and uh, bring up my talk. Uh, while I'm doing that, I want to say hello to my own student who I see in the audience is Niku Ajay. She's one of my very talented students. And I need to tell you guys that scientists are only as good as their trainees. So um, I'm very lucky to have a lab full of wonderful, talented uh, students of all levels. And it's actually one of the most rewarding things in my career to, to mentor you guys and to, and to train you and to see you accomplish great things and go on to great careers of your own. So um, the nice thing about neurosurgery is we're a small community, but we're actually a very close community and we're close knit. And because of all of the things we go through together in our training, which are very intense and challenging and difficult, we become like a family. And that's probably the first thing I'll tell you guys is that if you always treat your colleagues like family, then you're always going to love going to work every day and your trainees and, and students and people who work with you will always also be happy and happy people are productive people. <laughs> so, so that's probably the first piece of career advice I'll open with. I have some more for you at the end. But um, today I thought what I'd take you through is a little tour of um, my glioblastoma program. And that is not only the program in my lab, but the larger pan-Canadian group that I've been fortunate to lead and work with scientists across, um, across Canada, who all of us have a great interest in new target discovery for this very deadly and terrible brain tumor. So I thought this is one of three programs within my lab. My lab has been um, running at McMaster uh, University since 2007, which is when I started there as a pediatric neurosurgeon. After, as someone mentioned, I completed my residency training at University of Toronto. Um, and within that residency training, I did pursue my PhD partway through, dropped out, not dropped out of residency, but stepped away from residency to go into the surgeon scientist program where I undertook my PhD. Um, and so before that, I was at McMaster Med School. And before that, uh, I was at McGill University where I did my bachelor's of science in um, neurobiology and molecular genetics. So that my whole course is I've 
probably been at many of the schools that you guys are studying at now. And another great recommendation is Canada is a wonderful country. All the universities are excellent. So spending time at different places and understanding different ways of learning is also a great thing. So um, I thought that the best way to sort of give you an idea of, of um, what it is like or one way of being a neurosurgeon scientist and uh, one way of balancing research and surgery would simply be to show you how this program unfolded and how it was built and, um, and to kind of take you on a little tour of this program. So I'm not going to go into great depth and detail about the science um, because that's probably not the scope of the talk night, but also it's, it's, it's the evening and we're not going to drill down into details. There's no quiz. So I'll just take you on a nice tour. So the program that I'm introducing to you is about, it really emerged from the fact that, again, as someone mentioned, um, all of my models um, that I brought to McMaster University from my PhD and following residency are stem cell based models, because that's really within the, we apply a developmental neurobiology framework to the study of brain cancer, as Mohammed mentioned. And so this is really, um, this back in the early 2000s was a different way of looking at brain cancer. And so these new models inform our entire understanding of the cellular subpopulations that exist in GBM. And so I'll take you on this little tour of how we are trying to target clonal heterogeneity or how all these different cellular subpopulations evolve through time and through therapy to generate the recurrent tumor that is still so fatal and lethal and at this moment in time still incurable. So we are aiming to discover new targets in that recurrent GBM landscape and to target those new discoveries with uh, in novel immunotherapies. So I'll tell you a little bit about the program. So as I mentioned, the program is built um, from a team of world-class scientists across Canada. And the best thing I can tell you about our team is not only are we across different centers and we span the geography of the country, but also we span all different fields of science. And for another piece of career advice I would give you is it's, it's always great to hang out with people who are like you, like other neurosurgery residents or other medical students or other brain cancer scientists, but it's even more important to hang out with people who are not like you because you learn way more from people who speak a different language from you. So all these people on the screen when I met them spoke a totally different language than me because you've got Dr. Jason Moffat, who is a chair of functional genomics of cancer and is a world leading scientist in CRISPR technology and in biotechnology development at University of Toronto, Thomas Kisslinger, who is the head of medical biophysics at Princess Margaret Hospital and is a world leading proteomics expert. Dr. Kevin Henry, who's an amazing antibody engineer at the NASA National Research Council at University of Ottawa. Dr. Shashi Pujar, who talks nonstop about immunopeptidomics. He's out at Dalhousie, he's brilliant. And Yuri Ryman, who is a wonderful bioinformatician of brain cancer at, uh, and of different cancers at uh, um, OICR. So if you think about it, it would be hard to broach a conversation. Everyone speaks their own jargon. But the most important thing I can tell you about building a research team it's not just that it's multidisciplinary, but it's interdisciplinary. And I recently was preparing a very large grant application um, that really embraced those two terms and the di distinction between them. So multidisciplinary means, of course, this team naturally spans different fields of expertise, but interdisciplinary means that you build a program where everybody contributes at every step of the way, even the areas where they're not an expert. So that would mean that Dr. Henry, he actually has input and something to say in our target discovery platform and into the biology of GBM. And I can contribute my views to the antibody engineering campaign when it gets to that stage. So the idea is that everyone contributes to every stage of the research process, even the ones where you weren't classically an expert. And that way you're embracing all these different languages and views at every step of your process. So there's no point in creating a research team where it's still siloed. So you have a team where the antibody engineers all hang out together and only talk to each other, or the can brain cancer biologists do the same. It's much better to intermingle everybody and have them all talking to each other. So if we talk about glioblastoma, then um, really you guys know probably most
most ad we had a seminal breakthrough in the Journal of Medicine, one of which detailed the fact that temozolomide, an oral alkylating agent, could buy an additional two months overall of median survivorship for an entire population of GBM patients. So that was our massive breakthrough that we could eke out survivorship of from 12 months to 14 months, 14.6 months. And this was our biggest possible breakthrough. Now, within that entire population of GBM patients, we found that 26%, those who had a methylated MGMT promoter, could actually carve out even up to 26 months of survivorship. So there was a small group of patients who survived longer. But the idea at that point back then is we really didn't have a clear idea of how to fractionate those patients into molecular subgroups that would either be responders or non-responders. So you guys know in breast cancer, there are clear molecular subtypes, triple negative, you know, HER2 positive, and we know that their subtypes are both predictive and prognostic. So that means that those subtypes will predict who responds better to a certain molecular targeted therapy and also predict outcomes and prognosis. And even though we have molecular subtypes now in this day in, in GBM, they remain neither predictive nor prognostic which means we're missing something in there about trying to really understand the proper patterns of molecular classification. And so there's been so many confounding events since 2003, 2004, when those two back-to-back -back papers were published, one outlining the survivor, survival benefit uh, for temozolomide, and the second outlining the molecular mechanism of temozolomide. Since then, we really haven't had any seminal breakthroughs that have led to a new FDA-approved therapy. And in this day and age, you can see the standard of care is a maximal safe total surgical resection, as much as you can take out safely, followed by cranial irradiation combined with adjuvant temozolomide and then temozolomide on its own. And that hasn't changed. And that's the best standard of care we can find. And there's only four FDA approved drugs for GBM, and we really haven't made a lot of advances. And so you look at this and you realize another problem superimposed on that is that here you see this primary brain tumor and you see after all of this gold standard therapy, there's an MRI that looks a little bit better and the patient at that point is doing a little bit better. But unfortunately, 96% of patients in Canada, 95% in the US, it's the same really, will relapse with recurrent disease. And unfortunately, the biological landscape of that recurrence is very different from that of the primary tumor. And so there's this rapid, aggressive clonal evolution happening and we really need to understand that better to be able to, to really target this tumor. So if we look at everything, all those concepts that I've described, and here you can see, those are the molecular subtypes in this heat map on the, on the, um, on the, le on the left. And if I can just take you through a little proof of concept, you know, let's even, it does, you don't have to know anything about the molecular biology of this disease to follow this proof of concept. The problem is, is that in GBM, as just as in breast cancer, we did develop based on whole exome sequencing and on RNA sequencing platforms, we sequenced hundreds of GBMs and we were able to classify them robustly into four nice crisp molecular subtypes. And then we found out this green one neural, it actually represents the brain GBM interface and probably just has a normal brain pattern. So drop out the green. Now we have three reliable molecular subtypes, proneural, classical, and mesenchymal. And this was done back as the TCGA chose GBM as the very first tumor to, to do this kind of deep sequencing and genome characterization. So we've known about this since the early 2000s, late 90s even, that there are these three subtypes. But the problem is, is if we label a GBM as a classical GBM, the blue one, which is characterized by safe EGFR amplification and EGFR variant three mutations, then you can see here, if you deconvolute a single patient GBM on a single cell level, which we were finally able to do in 2014 in this lovely paper published in Science by Patel et al., what you can see is that classical GBM, it's really only the dominant molecular subtype you'd say 40% of the cells are blue. And so we're only capturing the dominant molecular subtypes, but actually this GBM has cells that are both proneural, the purple, and mesenchymal, the red. And in fact, even more alarming, look at the black cells. Those cells are actually unclassified. So they don't even fall into any of the molecular subtypes. Now you take this patient's GBM and you apply on top of that the DNA damaging agents of radiation and temozolomide, which are going to drive further mutational change and further clonal evolution. And you apply that selective therapeutic bottleneck. So maybe 80% of the cells die, but the ones that survive that selective pressure, 
they go on to change and generate different clonal hierarchies in daughter cells until finally you get to the GBM recurrence. And now what you have here is a tumor that is an entirely different cellular genomic epigenomic makeup, right? Now think about it, big pharma is back here and they're busy saying, oh, it's a classical GBM, let's develop an EGFR targeting agent. So guess what? Over the past two decades, we've developed probably 25 or 30 different ways of targeting EGFR. We've got small molecule inhibitors, we've got antibody drug conjugates, we've got you know, CAR T cells, we've got bispecific therapeutic engaging antibodies, we've got everything, anything you want. There's a million different ways of targeting EGFR. They all fail. And the reason they fail is because we're busy targeting this tumor, but meanwhile, the patient actually has this tumor. So what's the point of just killing this little handful of blue cells here? We're sparing all these other cellular cell populations. So the problem I'm getting at is that big pharma is developing their therapies against the biological landscape we know, the primary treatment naive GBM. But the therapies they're investing millions and millions of dollars in developing are not going to work on the recurrent GBM because 63% of these clones have evolved out of the recurrent tumor. So this is a big problem. We're not on top of our game here, guys. We're developing therapies against a tumor that's already changed into a different tumor. And even on a functional level over here on the right-hand side is another beautiful heat map from my former PhD supervisor, Peter Dirk's paper, his PNAS paper that he published after I left is one of my favorite papers he published. He took a single patient GBM and he took individual cells from that single GBM and plated them as clones and they grew out, grew out into big clones. And he plated each of those in a single well. And then he treated each of those individual clones with the whole panel of chemotherapeutics that you see on the vertical axis there. And you can see that every clone from the same patient's GBM has a differential drug sensitivity. So now we're getting into functional heterogeneity on top of the genomic, the genetic heterogeneity, the cellular heterogeneity, and now we've got functional heterogeneity. So, so many layers of heterogeneity that, that are evolving through space and through time. And we don't even fully understand how they evolve through space and time. This is from my former undergraduate student, then PhD student, now medical student at U of T, Maliha Kazi, published his first author paper. Um, this was a review where we were trying to comment on what is the different, what are the different ways of clonal evolution that a GBM can evolve from the primary treatment naive tumor all the way to recurrence? And what we find is not surprisingly, there are many different paths to recurrence, right? And so for example, in this top path here, you can see maybe there's a cancer stem cell that accumulates a bunch of mutations and that cell is capable, the gray cell can evade therapy and it can travel straight through the temozolomide and radiation. It can evade the therapy. It has all these different mechanisms for evading that therapy. And then that cell goes on to see the recurrence. But what if that cell gives rise to a daughter cell that then accumulates a different mutational profile and then that clone takes over and rises up and dominates the, the recurrence, and then you have a different composition. Or even worse, what if you have those clones giving rise to a cell that then acquires a mutation directly as a result of the therapy, those DNA damaging radiation and chemotherapies can also drive separate mutations that can then drive an entire recurrence. The most worrisome one is this one at the bottom, the green. The green dots are worrisome because it doesn't matter how often you survey the primary GBM, you will never find the clonal event that, that drives the recurrence because it's simply not there. It's not even there in the beginning tumor. You know, the, the, the top one and the middle one, it's possible that you could capture those events at a very rare frequency in the primary tumor. You could find those cell populations like a needle in a haystack, but the green one, you'll never find it in the primary. So this is the problem, unless we find a better way of modeling GBM and we have a, then if we superimpose on this, so the hierarchy that, that Maliha drew up, this is all based on cell intrinsic drivers. What about cell extrinsic forces? On the right side, you can see that there's a whole bunch of factors in the microenvironment, you know, that could be anything from the host tissues to the actual agents the patient's exposed to, or maybe they smoke, or maybe there's other things that they're exposed to. All of those things can also draw out different cellular subpopulations through time. So there's simply so many forces that can drive the evolution of GBM 
when we did a very elegant experiment where we did something called DNA barcoding, and we dropped, with the help of the Jason Moffat lab, 2 million barcodes on these GBM cells at the beginning. And then we watched them evolve through therapy, and now we can track every single cell individually and figure out which clones drive recurrence. Very disappointingly, Maliha and the team found out that every GBM recurs differently. And some of them are the top one, and some of them are the middle one, and some of them are the bottom one. And it's hard to predict from the beginning how they're gonna evolve differently. So really what this tells us is that we need to have a much better biological understanding of GBM recurrence. And the reason is we don't get many tissue samples from recurrent GBM patients. And that is because worldwide only 18 to maximum 30% of patients go for a second surgery. So it's only in those patients that we can capture that, that tissue sample directly from the patient. In everybody else, we really only ever have their primary treatment naive tumor to tell us, to give us a roadmap. And as you can tell, that's not a very good roadmap. So what do we do for the 70 to 80 to 90% of patients that we don't have that recurrent tumor specimen for? We can model that recurrence. And that's why my lab invested a lot of time and energy. And you can see, this is a kind of lesson as well in itself. You can always find a problem to study in your research program, but make sure it's a very relevant patient-driven problem that you need to solve. And so that's the lucky thing about being a surgeon scientist is that you have no end of important questions. They're all being asked by your patients. So anytime I hit a wall on the clinical side and I can't solve a problem with all my clinical arsenal of tools, I turn to the lab and I say, what can I do for this patient, right? So what we realized here is we have a, a dearth of, of access to the biology of recurrent GBM. So we invested our time and energy in building these models of GBM recurrence. So here we transplant the primary GBMs into the brain of the immunocompromised mice. And then we modify the strip protocol of radiation and temozolomide to deliver it for the metabolism of immunocompromised mice. So now we have this beautiful model and we wanted to make sure this model was deeply validated and that it really, really looked like patients. So here's another piece of advice I have you. All of our models in the lab are artifacts. They're artifactual, they're artifacts. Every model, it can't be the same as a real in vivo patient. But your job is to try to build models that as the best of possible faithfully recapitulate the observations you make in patients. And if they don't recapitulate what you see in patients, then throw the model out and start again and keep rebuilding the model until it resembles what you see in patients, because then you know you can use that model as a tool to study the disease in humans. So that's what we did with this model. We kept tinkering with it and we kept modifying it until we could see that we, we uh, calibrated the doses of radiation and temozolomide to mimic what would have been that middle slide on the first slide I showed you with the patient who had the good response to temozolomide and radiation. So these mice did not have surgery, but we titrated the doses of the chemo and the radiation to mimic what happens with the patient when they have a maximal safe surgical resection plus chemo and radiation. And then what we see is the mice all go on to relapse again, just like the humans do, and they gain the same survival benefit from radiation as humans do, and this looks very similar to human disease. So we really spent a lot of time optimizing this model to make sure that it was valid. And then in 2015, people started to hear about these really nice models that we were building in our lab, patient-derived models, models using human tissue. I always say these are models that are one step closer to translation because you're already studying human tissue, even though it's in a host animal. So what you can see here is that Jason Moffat walked into my lab with some of his colleagues back in 2015 with a test tube that was filled with what he said was $100,000 street value of an antibody he had just made. And it was an antibody called RWO3, which was an anti-human, very highly sensitive specific binder to the cell surface receptor CD133. CD133 was the protein that I first used in my PhD thesis, a receptor that identifies brain tumor initiating cells. So this we always thought would present an excellent target. It seemed to be an essential driver of brain tumor initiating cells. So wouldn't it be great to design an antibody that could specifically target that on GBM stem cells? So that was the first time we decided to test, to layer on to the chemo and radiation, add the CD133 antibody and see what happens. Do, do things get better for, for the mice with GBM? And that was how this entire program was born. 
And so what happened is we got together with these groups of scientists who we wouldn't otherwise have worked with. And we realized that all of us had one common goal, which is that we wanted to better understand the novel biological targets that we could unearth in recurrent GBM since we had these great models. And then we wanted to design new immunotherapies against these targets and then go back into the same models, which now can serve as preclinical testing models as well. Now we can test our new immunotherapies. And so you can see how this, what I call our translational pipeline was built. So the first pro project led by Dr. Moffitt was an integrative multi-omics target discovery platform focused on recurrent GBM and trying to deeply mine and understand its biology. All of the hits that come out of that, we then go on to prioritize and try to figure out the best list of possible new targets we could design new immunotherapies against. And we were agnostic to what type of immunotherapy it was. We tried to match it to the biology of the target as best as we could, but really we were interested in testing them all against each other and finding the best one. And those ones were found through the preclinical testing model where we could then do head-to-head -head comparisons of all of those different immunotherapies. Very interestingly, all of the new biology, the new therapies coming out of our pipeline attracted a lot of interest from industry partners who were all dying to find some new targets because it turns out that in GBM, we really have been going after the same 10 old biology targets for like 20 years now since temozolomide was discovered. And we haven't really had a lot of new targets to go after. And that's because people are really probing the biology of primary GBM. But as I mentioned, those targets may not be relevant by the time patients recur. So this was really great. We found a lot of excellent industry partners who wanted to help us move on from preclinical to clinical development. So this is just an example of the target discovery platform that we built. And again, another piece of advice I have for you guys is you guys can, if you're a cancer biologist like me, a stem cell biologist, cancer biologist, you can do what you do really well. You can build the best possible models and learn how to interrogate them and learn from them. But what really takes you to the next level of science is having other people come in and apply their incredible new biotechnological platforms to your beautiful models. And someone else who does this really well is I think another speaker in your series, my friend, Dr. Gallery Zade, she does this incredibly well too. She has learned to partner with the top scientists who have the coolest methylone profiling techniques. And then she can learn so much more than she could just learn on her own in her own lab. So really this interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary teamwork is what elevates your science to a higher level. So you can see here that what we did is with our actual model, now we can find a way to profile that clonal evolution through time. And what we did is we dropped the barcode libraries on the original tumors. We characterized the samples, the BTIC samples, transplanted them into mice. And now we can watch the tumor go through engraftment to this phase after therapy seems to work and debulk the tumor. And you have this minimal residual disease phase, which is fascinating. This is the bare bones of the cellular reservoir of disease that then gives rise to the recurrence. So you can see we can profile all the different stages in this model because we have the um, ability to sacrifice the mice at each time point and really understand the biology. And so we sent all these specimens for not only RNA sequencing, but single cell sequencing. And now we're moving on to ATAC-seq to characterize the epigenome in the same single cells. The barcoding has led us to understand all those different patterns of clonal evolution. And then you can see here that we're lucky at Hamilton Health Sciences to have about 30% of patients who go for second surgeries. So we can capture the primary and the recurrent matched pairs from the same patients, and then we can profile those extensively and document the change from primary to recurrent. So here with Dr. Kissinger, we do cell surface proteomics with immunotherapy. Most often you're interested in targeting the surface zone, and so that's where you want to be looking. And then with Dr. Moffitt, we have the advantage of doing these wonderful genome-wide CRISPR screens on primary and matched recurrent pairs from the same patients. So really novel biology, exciting stuff. We collate all of those hits, and this gives us an idea of what we can then target, new targets in, in, in recurrent GBM biology. So what I'll do now is very quickly just take you through um, the different biotechnological platforms that we built together as a group of scientists. And then I'll share with you a few of the cool targets that came out of the pipeline, just to give you an idea of how this program unfolds and how all this collaboration happens. 
So here you can see with the cellular barcoding, again, this is an absolutely fascinating kind of technology where every single cell or clone is labeled with a different barcode. And then you can actually do genomic DNA sequencing at all the different stages of the model to figure out what clones are represented where. And you can see these really fascinating bubble plots are showing you the frequency of the different clones at all different time points during the model. So again, we learned a lot, but um, really the interesting thing is that what we learned is that every patient's GBM recurs differently. And this is something that really starts to turn your, the wheels in your brain to think maybe we're gonna need more of a personalized medicine approach to really treat GBM properly. Not everyone is going to benefit from the same cure. And not only that, look at all these different clones. We're not gonna be able to target these with one therapy. We're gonna to have to develop a combinatorial approach of multiple therapies that target all of those different drivers to really treat GBM effectively. So we're learning a lot from our barcoding experiments. And look at this beautiful data that comes out of the CRISPR-Cas9 screens. So just in short, what these screens are telling us is that here you can see in the yellow, the, the hits that we found in, this is actually a patient matched pair. So the yellow is the primary GBM and the blue is the recurrent GBM from the same patient. And yet look at what incredibly different functional drivers exist in those two populations. Same genetic background, same patient, completely different genomic drivers. So what uh, CRISPR screens tell you in short is they're not telling you what genes are expressed. They're not telling you what proteins are expressed. What it is, is this is a screen that is actually showing you that as you culture cells in, in a dish in time, or there's in vivo CRISPR screens where you can put the cells into mice and watch them over time, which cells are able to survive over time. And what it's telling you is which genes are essential drivers that allow the cells to survive. And what we do is we will again test the cells with the bottleneck of therapy and figure out what are the essential drivers that allow the cells to survive beyond therapy. And what we find is that those drivers don't correlate with the expression level. So you can have a gene that's very highly expressed, but it may not be the essential functional driver. So this is giving us a whole different data set of information. Here you can see what we learned from the proteomics. And so this is really fascinating where we got 134 specimens. And of those, there were 44 matched primary recurrent pairs. And we were able to send all of those to Dr. Kisslinger for him to do whole cell proteomics as well as we constructed a tissue microarray. And that's where we can actually stain with one immunohistochemical stain, all of those 44 matched primary and recurrent pairs are represented on a single slide. And you can do one stain like CD133 and see how it changes before and after. And so we learned a huge amount from the proteomics as well. And very important for you guys to know the protein and the transcript level, it never matches. So what you read out of the TCGA, you get the transcriptome. Unfortunately, the proteome is reflecting a whole different story. So this is where you have to really be able to deal with almost unbearable complexity, right? Because <laughs> you think it's easy. Oh, look, I saw this on the, on the TCGA, and so I'll just target that. No, actually, maybe not even relevant when it comes to protein expression. So here's an example, too, of how quickly the proteome evolves. Again, you can see in red, this is the same patient. The red is the primary GBM. The blue is the recurrent GBM from the same patient. And this patient, you can see, has a very high expression of EGFR. So this is a classical GBM. This patient fell into that subtype. And so what you can see here is this patient, by the time they get to recurrence, there's no EGFR in blue. So this patient has actually lost that clone. And that's not unexpected, because I told you 63% of what you see in red is going to evolve out by the time you get to recurrence. But really fascinatingly, this patient was enrolled in an AbbVie trial, the ADC414 trial, which was an antibody drug conjugate targeting EGFR. So you'd think, oh, that's fantastic. This should work for this patient, right? She's EGFR driven. So this patient enrolled in the trial and then went on to have this landscape without EGFR. So there's two explanations for that. Either the patient received the drug and it successfully targeted EGFR and now it's gone, or EGFR just evolved out on its own. So the patient herself was so interested to know which one it was that when the trial finished, she called Abby and she said, which arm was I in? And they unblinded her and they told her you were in the control arm. So she didn't even receive the drug. So that clone evolved out regardless. And that therapy, we, we don't know if it would have helped her, but regardless, it just shows you how much natural clonal evolution is going on. And then here you can see in the recurrent tumor, we're now seeing a completely different landscape coming up. 
And this landscape is actually an immunosuppressive landscape. So what we realized is that the commonality of all the pathways we're seeing coming up is a lot of them are involved with tumor associated macrophages in the niche of GBM that are driving immunosuppression. So the GBM cells themselves are sending signals to the macrophages in the niche to say, hey, hide me, give me some cover. I don't want anyone to know I'm here. So they're naturally immunosuppressing and hiding out. And so this was a little frightening to see how uh, seemingly intelligent these GBM cells are. This is our single cell platform. And fortunately, you know, I just mentioned to you the tumor immune microenvironment. One of the drawbacks of our model, one of the limitations or weaknesses of the patient derived xenograft model, as much as I think it's a gold standard model, it is not able to look at the tumor immune microenvironment because the cells we transplant, they're only BTICs, they're all GBM cells. And furthermore, the mouse himself, the immunocompromised mice, mouse, doesn't have any a huge number of immune cells to send into the tumor. So we can't read out the tumor immune microenvironment. And that is why we realized to complement our knowledge, we would need to study syngeneic mouse models where there's the immunocompetent mice that develop GBM that actually have that immune environment. And so we were able to undertake single cell profiling of both our patient and um, primary and recurrent matched pairs and of these syngeneic mouse models. And that way we could put all the information together to try to learn a little bit more and do some correlations and figure out a little bit more about the niche. And so you can see, this is a wonderful postdoc together with students in my lab and a, a postdoc, um, Nick Michalowicz in uh, Dr. Jason Moffat's lab developed these cool new analytic platforms. And this is where it is really nice for my cancer biology team to be working with these computational people and developing this really broad understanding and new programs to really understand GBM. And here you can see the application of those programs. And now we're not just looking at tumor cells, but we can understand the immune and the vascular cells that we find as well. And then we can even understand how those cells signal to each other. So now we're starting to look at ligand receptor interactions, cell-cell interactions between the immune infiltrates and the GBM cells. And we can start to map out how those cells are talking to each other. So the single cell technology really permitted some fascinating um, uh, biology. So now I'll take you a little bit through some of the targets that came out of the pipeline. So I told you about the platforms we developed, and now you're probably interested to know what kind of biology is coming out of this interesting pipeline and what kind of therapies are we developing. So uh, and not surprisingly, as you could already guess from the story I told you about Dr. Moffat back in 2015, our very first hit out of the pipeline was CD133. And this, of course, dated all the way back to my PhD a long time ago now, where you can see that we isolated these brain tumor initiating cells. And CD133 is actually a marker of multiple, multiple cancer stem cell populations. Overall, this marker is highly expressed in very treatment refractory aggressive cells in, across all different human malignancies. And so I remember I told you that we were really, really loving the whole concept of head-to-head -head comparisons. So what we did here is we actually took that RW03 antibody that Dr. Moffat developed and we used it as a naked IgG and then we developed a bispecific T cell engaging antibody. So this antibody has two arms and one arm binds a CD3 positive T cell and draws in that cytotoxic T cell. The other one binds your tumor associated antigen like CD133. So you're bringing together a cytotoxic T cell and a GBM cell, encouraging the T cell to kill the GBM cell. So it's a cytotoxic modality of immunotherapy, and, um, and it's called a bite, a bispecific T-cell engager, or in our case, we called it a DATE, uh, dual antigen T-cell engager. And so we built that against the same epitope, and then we built a second generation CAR T-cell, an engineered T-cell using the same epitope. So now we go and test in the same patient-derived models, these three different immuno, immuno, immunomodalities, and we figure out which one works best for GPM. So in the end, it was the CAR T cell that won. The CAR T cell won because they were like little homing missiles and they could basically go on a search and destroy mission. We placed them straight into the brain and they could basically traffic through the brain and cross the corpus callosum and go over to the other hemisphere and find all of the cells that, that are CD133 positive. Every cell, whether high expressing or low expressing, they could find every, every cell with that epitope. And so we found some really remarkable efficacy with the CAR T cell. And that's when we actually spun a company out of our pipeline and out of our team. 
And this company was motivated not by me, but by my trainees, my very entrepreneurial and uh, industry savvy trainees who came to me and said, hey, Sheila, we've been working in this MyTax fellowship for a year now, and we've never seen any preclinical data package as good as this one. So you need to do something with this IP. And I think I said something like, what's IP? <laughs> so uh, I wasn't really thinking along the lines of being entrepreneurial at that time. I was very focused on being an academic clinician scientist, but you should never ignore an opportunity that life puts in front of you. So that's another piece of advice. You don't have to stick to the path that you think is carved out for you. Make sure that you always explore other opportunities. And like I tell my students in the lab, sure you have a hypothesis, but don't focus only on the data you expect from your hypothesis. Pay attention to the unusual data, the outlying data, the side observations. Very often those are the things that will take you down the path to discovery. So don't ignore the, the things on the periphery of well, even though you're a focused person and you think you're goal oriented, focus on your goals, so that's great, but don't ignore, don't ignore the side observations. So, so what happened with that company is we spun out a company called Empirica Therapeutics. We put all this beautiful data that was um, that came out in this paper in May of 2020. And then in June in, of 2020, we were acquired, Empirica was acquired by Century. But, um, and Century Therapeutics is a very large allogeneic CAR T-cell company based in the US. It had a huge amount of funding from Bayer, Versant, Fujifilm. They had a proprietary IPS platform to develop allogeneic CAR T-cells. And what they really saw in Empirica was, we want this company to become our brain cancer program. And so we negotiated with them and we said, that's great, but we don't want you just to walk away with everything we have. We'd like to keep a hand in the science. You know, we probably do the science better than you can. So why don't you stay here in Canada? Let the science stay in Canada and we'll create a little subsidiary, which now resides in the McMaster Innovation Park. And now I'd say a good, probably one quarter of my lab has decided to migrate over and join Century. So they've created a wonderful team now of 11, 12, gonna be 14 people soon. And they are busy doing the clinical development now of the CD133 allogeneic uh, NK cell actually is what they decided to go with. So the wonderful thing is that we were able to keep that science in Canada and build out our innovation sector here as well. They are still able to partner with Dr. Moffat and I, who now sit on the Scientific Advisory Board of Century, and they've asked us to stay along for four years so that we can see this program through to clinical trials. So it's very exciting, and uh, it's really great to have a path for the students in your lab who like to do industry things. It's very important. Not everyone needs to go to academia, and it's great to foster that path as well. So this is just a little bit of the data that showed how effective the CAR T cell was. Again, again, everything really resides in this very deeply validated data packages. You can't do anything superficially. Everything has to be done properly. And one thing you guys may recognize is that unlike EGFR variant three, which is 100% tumor specific and only expressed on GBM cells, CD133 is also expressed on normal stem cell populations. So the first thing an industry partner would say is, oh my goodness, that's very risky, what about toxicity? So we built a humanized mouse model with the help of our colleague and friend, Dr. Kristen Hope. She humanized the bone marrow niche of some mice for us. And then we were able to test our CD133 CAR Ts and bites against those normal human hepatopoietic stem cells to see is there any effect? Is it killing those cells as well? Fortunately, we were able to find out that there was only a transient decrease in the hematopoietic stem cells. In fact, CD133 is somewhat dispensable for hematopoiesis and there's other cell populations that took over and these mice recovered in about one week. And so that gave us a good idea and we saw the same data coming out of a trial of a CD133 CAR T in China where the patients had a transient anemia that self recovered after two weeks. So that gives a really good idea that perhaps this therapy, especially if it's delivered locally into the brain, um, and that we may not have severe systemic toxicities with this therapy. So I'll tell you a little bit about a few more hits that came out of our pipeline, just out of interest to share with you the fact that we already recognize that one monotherapy is never going to cure a heterogeneous and rapidly evolving tumor like GBM. And so another question that my student Neil had is, okay, that's fine, Sheila, you have this really good CD133 CAR T, but after you treat with the CAR T, and I'll just jump right this to this slide to show you, 
after you treat with the CD133 CAR T, there's still a tumor there. And yeah, it's a much smaller tumor and it's mostly CD133 negative, but shouldn't we target that too? And so another important lesson is don't ignore failures. You should always explore the failures and figure out the reason for the failures. Don't just throw something away because it didn't work. So what we did here is we examined the residual after we treated with the CD133 CAR-T and we found that it really seemed to express a lot of this protein called GPNMB. So how did we find GPNMB? So about four or five years before Neil joined the lab, we had done this really lovely experiment where we had sorted CD133 positive and negative glioma stem cells. And then we sorted the same human neural stem cells into CD133 positive and negative compartments. And we did transcriptional transcriptome profiling of all of these different four compartments. And what we found that is in the CD133 negative glioma stem cells, the most upregulated gene was GPNMB. So then we said, well, what about the protein level? Because I told you how very often transcript and protein don't correlate. Well, look at this good news. It turns out that on, in our volcano plot of our proteomics, GPNMB is highly upregulated in the recurrent tumor. And in fact, remember that tissue microarray with the 44 matched pairs? Here we looked at GPNMB expression and look how it's so much up in the recurrence compared to the primaries. So GPNMB is upregulated. And again, remember, this is the program we built. This is generating all kinds of data that we can go back and probe for all kinds of different questions, right? So it's really good to have that deep database as well. So GPNMB does seem to be highly enriched in the mesenchymal subtype of GBM. It's not expressed in normal brain tissue, which is hopefully good for a toxicity profile. So then we went to our antibody engineer, Dr. Kevin Henry, and we said, can you please build us a beautiful camelid single domain antibody against GPNMB? And he said, of course I can. And he built us this beautiful antibody. And very interestingly, he also, we also got a mouse antibody from other colleagues. And we realized that in this engineering mouse model, the GPNMB was not only expressed on the GBM cells, but also on the tumor-associated macrophages in the tumor immune microenvironment. So we got really even more excited. How powerful would it be to have a therapy that targets not only the GBM cell, but also um, the, the, the tumor immune microenvironment? So here's another lovely example of, um, of, a, of a dual targeting agent that specifically pursues cancer, cancer stem cells. So you guys may know about the efferins. The efferins are actually very important regulators of axonal guidance in normal development. They are part of a 14 member family of receptor tyrosine kinases, the largest family of receptor um, tyrosine kinases. And there are these two lovely papers published in Cancer Cell that each of them said separately that efferin A2 and efferin A3 each drive cancer stem cell populations and they present targetable vulnerabilities in GBM. So that's great. But the question we asked is we said, well, that's fine, but if you only target efferin A2, then you're gonna spare the efferin A3 positive cancer stem cells to go on and drive the recurrence and vice versa. So we really thought it was important that although we went back with this beautiful efferin profiler from our colleague Dev Sidhu, where he can actually look at every single efferin antibody and epitope. So these are multiple epitopes against the same efferins, but it represents all 14 efferin family members. And here we have 10 GBM lines from the Sing Lab, four, uh, six primary and four recurrents. And we can map out comprehensively all the efferins and how they're expressed across all these different GBMs. And so we did validate that efferin A2 and efferin A3 are the most highly expressed efferins in recurrent GBMs. But we really realized we could, should develop a therapeutic strategy that targets both of them, not just one. And so we validated this with some beautiful biology. So one thing that stem cell biologists do really well is sort cells into different subpopulations. So here we sorted into the four different quadrants of efferin A2 and A3 positive and negative cells. And we found of course that the double positives generated the largest tumors. And when you knock out um, both of the efferins that you get the biggest reduction in tumors. And so the biology really bears out that it's not just that efferin A2 and A3 are expressed on GBM cells, it's that they are functionally important. And that's another important thing. Just because something's expressed, it doesn't mean that it's functionally important. But these experiments are telling us that yes, they are important for cancer stem cell self-renewal and tumor genicity. So that was enough of a rationale to convince our antibody engineers to generate this beautiful bispecific efferin A2, A3 targeting um, bispecific antibody. 
And then we went on and Maliha went and tested this to find that it really was targeting FNA2 and A3 and, and causing um, blockage of phosphoephrine A3 and A2. And here we were able to show that when you put this anti bispecific antibody into the mouse brain, you do see indeed a reduction of tumor burden of a recurrent GBM. And we found that this was not only through the down regulation of your typical oncogenic pathways, but very interestingly, there was also an up regulation of differentiation pathways. So somehow blocking both of these important cancer stem cell populations was inducing a differentiation program in the GBM and causing it to become less aggressive and more indolent. So this was a really interesting paper that we were able to put out into the world and it generated a lot of interest. I'm gonna share with you one last, uh, I think I have two more quick targets to show you that are very interesting. So this is a target that came out of um, Chirayu Chokshi, who is a very talented PhD student in my lab. And he did all of the whole genome CRISPR screens. So in our interdisciplinary program, he rotated in the Moffitt lab for four months, learned how to do whole genome CRISPR screens, promptly came back to Singh lab, started doing whole genome CRISPR screens, and then he taught everyone else in the lab how to do whole genome CRISPR screens. So Niku, who's attending today, she does, um, she's done an in vivo CRISPR activation screen, which is the coolest thing imaginable, but everyone really learned a lot of technology from Chirayu. So you can see here that what Chirayu did is he went to the Broad Institute's database of 666 cell lines, and he wanted to sift through those and find out what genes are essential drivers, those critical genes that are important for the function and survival of GBM cells. And he found, not surprisingly, one of the top genes was SOX2. And that, of course, is a very important neural stem cell and brain tumor initiating cell regulator. But also he found this interesting phosphatase called PTP4A2. And the really interesting thing is that PTP4A2 was specifically upregulated in recurrent GBMs and essential to recurrent GBMs. So not only is it there at high levels and transcript in protein, but it's an essential driver. And the interesting thing is it's not essential in primary GBMs. Primary GBMs couldn't care less. If you deplete them of PTP4A2, they're fine. They keep on trucking, they keep on surviving. But if you deplete a recurrent GBM of PTP4A2, it, can, it can't survive. Those cells just stagnate and die. So we found that PTP4A2 was selectively essential in recurrent GBMs. And in fact, here's that phenomenon I told you. So we went and knocked out PTP4A2 in primary GBMs and see the cells don't care. See, they, they really don't care. They're, they're still growing, they're still self-renewing, they're still proliferating. But look what happens when we knock them out in recurrent GBM. Then you can see that the cells just can't manage when you knock out PTP4A2 in recurrent GBM. So we met this wonderful chemist, Dr. John Lazo from the University of Virginia, who has developed a whole class of phosphatase inhibitors that are really wonderful. He's a really renowned medicinal chemist, and he was really excited to collaborate with us. And he sent us a really nice small molecule PTP4A2 inhibitor. And we went and did phosphoproteomics to try to understand what does PTP4A2 interact with to, to execute this activity. And very excitingly, we found Robo1, which is another axonal guidance gene, just like the efferens. So that's not surprising that axonal guidance gene should be upregulated in this very in invasive migratory infiltrative tumor. But what was very exciting for us is that Robo1 came up as a separate hit from our pipeline. So now we found two hits coming out of our pipeline and they interact with each other. That's pretty cool. So we got very excited because we thought, oh my goodness, this is a combinatorial targeting strategy just being thrown in our face. So you can see here that when you, when you look at knocking out PTP4A2, um, you actually see a full-on depletion of all axonal guidance family members, especially Robo1. So there definitely, there's an interaction between these two. And so we went back to Dr. Henry and we said, could you please generate us some Robo1 antibodies now? We can combine them with the PTP4A2 inhibitor. And so that's the next campaign that's ongoing right now in the lab, which is very, very exciting. And again, I told you we had separate evidence that Robo1 was a separate target to pursue. And so it's lovely that Chirayu was able to train our undergraduate student, Benjamin Raquel, and now he's working more on developing a CAR T cell against Robo1 that we can compare against Dr. Henry's IgG. So very exciting when some of the targets synergize like that. It just makes our lives easier. 
This is a final story that just came out in the Journal for Immunotherapy of Cancer from Matthew Seyfried, a postdoctoral fellow on the GBM team, as well as Will Nache, who's a really great PhD student. And this is another exciting story because this is the example of a target that may actually be a double jeopardy scenario, killing two birds with one stone. So CD70 has been shown by multiple people, including my colleague, neurosurgeon scientist, Dr. Dwayne Mitchell at the University of um, Gainesville in Florida. He's the only neurosurgeon I know who has a PhD in immunology. He's incredibly smart and he's a collaborator of ours now too. But Dr. Mitchell had already published papers showing that CD70 was highly upregulated in recurrent GPM. And what we did is we found that CD70, which happens to be the cognate receptor of CD27, is actually expressed on normal T cells as well. So our rationale was, what if you could develop a CD70 CAR T cell that is knocked out for CD70? So what that means is it's not gonna kill its other CAR T cells because otherwise you're worried it's gonna kill its own uh, brethren. So this is, a, this is a way of avoiding a problem in, in CAR T cell therapy that's called fratricide. So we published this lovely paper showing this is a great target to go after. It is expressed on the GBM cells. It's also expressed on T cells in the tumor immune microenvironment. Why not kill both of them to really, really get at GBM? Because to target GBM successfully, we realized you can't only target the tumor, you have to target its immune microenvironment or microenvironment as well. I'm gonna finish before I jump to career advice with um, a really beautiful new program that's developed um, in our lab. And um, I thought you guys would be really interested in this because it involves, um, and this program never could have been developed without contributions from patients. Now patients are essential to our work. Patients are who we work for, they're who we care for. And when we go to the lab, it's their problems we're trying to solve. So everything we do as clinician scientists really is all about patients. But this story is really more of a direct application of how our work really is driven by patients. And it was a patient who helped me develop this program. So you guys have heard me talk a lot about temporal heterogeneity, right? Like how the tumor evolves through time. What about space? <laughs> so here's a whole other dimension that we haven't tackled because you know, when a neurosurgeon sends us a piece of the tumor, they usually just pick any little tiny piece they want that maybe is like the size of one pixel here and they send it to the lab and then we grow out it and we study and we culture it. But is that tiny piece really representative of the whole tumor? Is this really? It's probably not. And so what we're lacking is an understanding of how the entire GBM, the entire regional profile of a GBM is actually mapped out in a patient. We don't know that. We always only study these tiny little selective biopsies. What if we could get the entire GBM of a patient and profile it in all of these different ways? So we were really lucky. So you see, this is the problem. This is what we're studying now, but what we really need to be studying is all of that. And we never can receive that much tissue from a patient when they're alive, right? So there was a wonderful patient named Cindy Lee Graham. And Cindy Lee Graham had enrolled in every possible study involved in the Singh lab because she was herself a scientist, a research um, scientist, and she really believed in research. And so she sent us her primary tumor. She sent us her recurrent tumor. She sent us her blood, which we used for whole genome uh, sequencing. And she, as the germline for her whole genome sequencing, and we even made CAR T cells from her own blood to try to attack her own tumor in the patient derived xenograph. So we had every sample possible from Cindy. And what she said to us is, you know, I'm really glad you have been able to profile my whole tumor but you really won't understand it completely unless you understand the end point. And the end point is death. And she said, when I die, I wanna donate my whole brain and my whole GBM to your lab so you can see the entire thing. And so she really opened our eyes to the fact that our understanding of spatial heterogeneity could never be fulfilled unless we could capture an entire GBM. And so our neurosurgeons came together with our wonderful team at the McMaster Anatomy Bequeathal Program. And we were so lucky that this article was featured on the front, front page of the Globe and Mail, and it generated so much interest and excitement and empathy. And Cindy really inspired a lot of other GBM patients to, to contact us and say, we want to do the same thing. And the very unique thing that Singh Lab did with our team of neurosurgeons and um, the anatomy lab is that not only are we able to, most of the time when patients go for an autopsy, the brain is formal and fixed. And that is an important way of studying the brain 
But you know what we do in SingLab, we generate patient-derived cell lines. And what we realized is that no one had ever generated regionally specific cell lines that span the entire GDM of a patient at autopsy. In order to get live cells from a patient, we have to get to them very quickly after death. So this rapid autopsy program is able to bring patients to our anatomy lab within two to four hours of death. And we're able to generate these live cell lines that regionally map out the entire um, spatial heterogeneity of the tumor. So we divide the tumor coronally into thirds and we send one third to generate cell lines. One third is formal and fixed, which can then go on to do all kinds of beautiful multi-parameter immunofluorescence or proteomics with Dr. Kisslinger. And then the rest is fresh frozen which we can then use as single cell isolates to do single cell profiling, all kinds of DNA and mutational profiling as well. This way we can map out and develop an atlas of regional heterogeneity to really try to understand how spatial heterogeneity is impacted and how the evolution of a GDM happens over space as well as time. This is an example of that multi-parameter immunofluorescence where my wonderful colleagues um, in the Kai Bucher Fending Lab at Harvard can use a program called Codex to look at 40 different markers at the same time. And you can see they look at many markers that interest us like CD133. So now we've engaged even more scientists uh, that we've added to our team. We've got Federico Gaiti, who is a wonderful new epigenome scientist at um, the Donnelly Center. Um, we've engaged Dr. Marco Mera, who's developing new single cell mutational profiling technology at UBC. And we're just looking through and trying to decide how much can we accomplish to study all of these different regions that we've captured from now five patients who have entered our uh, rapid autopsy program. So this will generate a whole new atlas of knowledge that I hope will enrich our ability to find new targets, not only in recurrent GDM, but in GDM at endpoint, which is after all what our patients have come to. So I think today I've been able to tell you guys that we know a lot about the biology of the primary GBM. And in this program, it's specifically trying to generate more knowledge about the biology of recurrent GBM so that we can better understand targets that may be more pertinent to our patients when they come to us helpless, saying, please help me, what clinical trial should I enroll in? What experimental therapy should I take now? Maybe we can be better guides for them, we can better understand their biology. So there's my lab who I'm very grateful to. Um, and you can see Niku standing there behind Parvez. Um, and there's Parvez, who was the postdoctoral fellow who you noticed was the first author on the cell stem cell paper about the CD133 immunotherapies. When Century was acquired, he went on and he's now actually the head of uh, Century uh, Therapeutics Canada Lab. So it's really great to see all the people you train go out and deploy them into the world and now they're doing amazing things. And uh, I always tell Parvez, well, don't get too rich or too famous because you still have to work with me too, so. <laughs> So um, I'll finish just on a few slides um, if I have time. Oh my goodness, I talked for far too long. Um, I'll, I'll just very quickly kind of cap this talk with a few small pieces. I tried to give you some advice during the talk, but um, this is what Dr. Dirks always said to me <laughs> about the tensions of being a surgeon scientist. It's not easy to try to be really good at two things. And so it's very hard sometimes to fluctuate between the two worlds. This was Dr. Rob Hollenberg, who was the solo pediatric neurosurgeon in my community in Hamilton Health Sciences for 27 years before he mentored me into my job. And he, this is what he used to tell people about my breakdown. He said, oh, she's not 50-50, she, she works harder than that. And then this is even like probably yesterday, my mother said that to me. So, so, so it seems like you're kind of taking on too much, right? But it's actually a very rewarding career, right? And as I mentioned during the talk, we have access and the privilege of caring for patients. And we understand what the limits of clinical medicine are and where do the problems begin that have to be solved by a different approach. And those are the questions that you can import over into your lab program. And these really iterative approaches where now we not only talk about translation, but we talk about reverse translation. So you make observations in patients and then you go back to the lab and model them in the lab, right? So, and then hopefully you'll discover something in the lab develop a cure, and then that can translate into patients. So it's like, it's, a, it's an iterative pathway. And we are the people who are right there with the patients. So we're poised to translate our discoveries into patients, right? So there's a lot of rewards to the very long career path, right? When you start, the most important thing you do is train people. 
And the reason is, is because for you to build a program, you have to build people who are so expert and you can trust them and you send them out to do things. And then that really reaps a lot of reward. So invest all your energy into training people so you can translate your knowledge and then eventually they become way smarter than you, which is great. So the other thing is you want to make sure you know who works for you, understand how their brains work. Don't assume that they're just like you. Because if you just assume that everyone thinks like you, then you're not going to be able to figure out how to, how to really get them to enjoy their own work. And then the important thing is, although you're going back and forth between the two sides, don't carry your stress between the two worlds. Like don't dump it on the other people. So I don't like coming over to the lab and telling them about the horrible, sad things I've seen on the patient side. I don't like going over to the clinic and moping around because I didn't get a grant. You know, don't carry your stress from side to side. Try to start with like a clean slate on both sides. So the way I see it is after I've worked really hard on the clinical side and I'm tired and there's been some really stressful surgeries, then I come to the lab on Monday and I can kind of change gears, switch gears and decompress. And then it's a delight you know, to walk into the lab and see all my happy people. Oh, we're so glad you're back. And then you can sort of reset, right? And then after I've been in the lab for a while, it's exciting to go back and see patients again. So going back and forth, make each of the places more of a, like a happy place to be and don't carry stress from side to side. When you develop your research program, it's very contextual as to where you are. If you're in a place where you already have a lot of people working in the program area that you're in, then you're going to be building with them and building as part of a team. You may go somewhere where they don't even have your technology, like Dr. Shashi Gujar, who went out to Dalhousie and he's like, you know, doing all kinds of great new things that no one there has done before, right? So there's different ways of developing a research program. But the best way is to discuss it with your mentors or your PI who trained you and, and really try to figure out which path suits your personality the best. It's always a good idea to match your research focus with your clinical focus, just so that you can have benefit from that iterative approach of seeing patients with brain tumors and then studying brain tumors. It's very helpful to develop that focus on both sides. Again, ask very patient-driven questions um, and really do make sure that you then run those patient-driven questions by people who you respect and really do um, try to think outside the box, right? And so the the asset that we have that differentiates us from other scientists is that we have the two perspectives. So really benefit from that and make sure that you're studying unique questions. So we really are like time travelers and we're constantly going back and forth between the two worlds and make sure that you really make the most of that experience. And again, um, you always think you're the first person to hit on something, but you almost never are, right? <laughs> so almost everything that you find is a reinvention of some kind. So just make sure that you have a creative way of, of reinventing something that you find and always be humble because you, you can always say, oh, I was the first person to find that, but you probably weren't, right? So just be humble about it. Um, and this is really important too, is that when you get to the stage of your career where you're fully trained and you're about to start your practice, you have to recognize that, that you are now the leader. And like Dr. Bill Tucker from St. Mike's told me, you're the end of the line. Your advice is a gold standard. So don't get annoyed when family doctors call you and ask you questions. You are the expert. It's your job to tell people the right way to do things. And he would always say to me, it's good that they're calling you. God knows what they would do if they didn't get your advice. You know, So, so don't be annoyed with people. You're the expert now. And that's your job to give everyone that advice. Um, and really the other thing you have to believe in is that you have been extremely well trained and you're ready to become that expert, right? And even the people in my lab, as young as they are, it's my happiest moment when I watch them become poised and full of confidence and they go out and deliver a lecture on their topic and they realize, oh yeah, I know more about this than a lot of people, I'm an expert. And that's a great thing to see people develop that expertise. So it is a balancing act. You always find yourself doing a million different things. And some, on some days I feel like this elephant because sometimes you're just running back and forth and, and uh, it's hard to stay poised. And sometimes if you superimpose the risk of neurosurgery, it's actually more like this is the balancing act you're doing because we take a lot of risk in what we do, but risk is good. Actually being bold pays off as well. And that's the last thing I'll probably tell you is that it's not... I've observed part of our Canadian temperament to be very bold. We're pretty risk averse people, but there are a lot of risks worth taking. So just try to be bold as well. Once you've become fully trained and you're expert and you're confident, that's the time to be bold as well. Maybe not as bold as this guy, but bold. 
So I'll just finish. Thank all my colleagues, my lab members, my wonderful clinical colleagues. And this is a picture of me with two of my mentors. That's um, Ernest uh, McCulloch, uh, the, the small man um, who died unfortunately recently, and Jim Till, who is still alive. And they, Till and McCulloch discovered hematopoietic stem cells. They're part of the long hierarchy of um, Canadian discovery and stem cell biology. And that's me um, just before our first our paper, I think I was eight months pregnant with my younger son, Raphael, which means that when he was born, I was doing revisions on our nature paper. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's a nice picture of me and two of my very uh, inspiring mentors. So make sure that you seek out your mentors. That's a good part of our community being small is that you have like a, a good family of mentors in the fields in which you study and just stick with them and, and make sure that they always can guide you. So I'll finish there. And I'm really sorry I did talk far too long. That was incredible. Thank you so much. We certainly enjoyed the overtime lecture. So uh, thank you for that. Um, we'll open the floor to some questions. I have two, but I'll wait. Um, so if anyone likes to raise their hand and unmute themselves, uh, we can begin. I think Pedro actually, Pedro already has a question. Sorry, I didn't see it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Dr. Singh, that was a brilliant lecture. It just gives you, like, it gives me perspective just how crazy GBM is, but how complex uh, new, therapeutic, new therapeutic techniques are in terms of, uh, you know, being crafted to target specific things in GBM. Um, what I was wondering about is, um, uh, and maybe, maybe you, you had spoken about it just a little bit, but I wanted to uh, see if you could expand a little bit on uh, virotherapy and how like oncolytic viruses, like how that is, um, you know, how that aspect of things are, is going for GBM, if it's being tried, yes. if it's being investigated. Um. Yeah, that's a great question, Pedro. So actually McMaster University has a long history in um, ever since Frank Graham um, made some seminal discoveries in studying oncolytic viruses. And so we have a lot of people with a long track record. And what I've observed is that oncolytic viruses are very useful in the setting of GBM when combined with a pure targeted therapy. The oncolytic virus itself, what it's really good at is relieving that immunosuppression and helping to alert um, the immune system that, hey, there's a GBM hiding out here. So the oncolytic viruses are particularly good at relieving immunosuppression. And that's the way I think they can best be partnered with maybe a very focused targeted therapy, a small molecule or a, a, a directed CAR T cell combined with an oncolytic virus would be a really brilliant idea. So there are oncolytic viruses that have been in trial. They, like everything that's tried as a monotherapy in GBM, they fail alone but they can be highly effective, I believe, if they're combined with other therapies. Very interesting, thank you. Okay, I can, I can do, should go next. Sure, okay. I just wanna make sure that other people have a chance. Uh, one is scientific, one is non-scientific. I'll maybe ask the scientific one first. So, um, you talk about epigenetic dynamics uh, in uh, cancer stem cells. I'm wondering what role does histone modifications play in, in the stem state of it? And I'm sorry if you may have already addressed this, my internet was disconnected, so hopefully it's under reiteration. No, no, it's not at all. I didn't touch that topic, so it's a great question, Saman, because recently, especially with diffuse midline gliomas in pediatric patients, you know there's a whole subset of histone mutations, H3K27M, that have thought to be very important drivers in that subset of midline diffuse midline gliomas. And so um, people have already realized that there are probably targetable histone mutations that we should be developing antibodies or other immunotherapies against. And so there is a whole field of discovery ongoing there. It's a very smart idea. And there's an even another whole field right now happening in medulloblastoma where people are recognizing that there are post-translational changes that we haven't even thought about before that need to be targeted. And so there's a lot of people now going after those post-translational modifications. So I think um, it's clear that the epigenome is a huge driver of a lot of that evolution. And so our better understanding of it will lead to whole new classes of therapies. Thank you. Um, I can wait and then ask the second question or go ahead, I'm not sure. I can ask a question if you don't mind, someone. Um, 
So Dr. Singh, you, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the great lecture. I, I really enjoyed that. And I, I learned a lot from the last part as well, when you talk about the balance between the clinical work and research. Um, so since we are talking about the women in neurosurgery series, so I have also a question about the balance between the um, like a work as a surgeon, as a researcher, and also the personal life. You mentioned that you were pregnant when you were working on the, on the, on the paper. So how do, you, how do you make that balance with the personal life and being a successful researcher and surgeon as well? That's a really good question, Mohammed. And the, the funny thing is, is that I think I would give the same answer to the young women here as I would to you lovely young men, right? Because I think you guys are assuming now more and more of an equal role in all of those other responsibilities in life that don't have to do with work. And I see this even in my junior partner, Dr. Yaroskavich, who's like fully participating in raising his two young sons. And so it's the same challenges across the board work-life balance for both men and women, right? Because now I think we've become more equal partners. You have become more equal partners. But the answer for me was really in having an equal partner. And so it's my husband who shouldered so much to help me. And what you'll find when you survey all of the women who have spoken in your lecture series, they all have wonderful partners. They all have wonderful life partners who are 50-50 people who share everything, right? And so um, I think my husband has definitely facilitated my career. Um, he's not here, his ears are, would be burning, but he definitely, in choosing the partner who supports your career goals and your aspirations fully, and furthermore, making um, sacrifices of your own such that you would be closer to your family so that your family can also um, support you. So we were fortunate to live next to near both sets of parents who were very active in helping raise my children and um, taking care of them while I had to stay late in the operating room. So it's a kind of, I suppose it's a kind of Hillary Clinton, it takes a village answer is really the best answer that applies to men and women, right? Um, so the answer is uh, for me um, to be humble. Don't think that you can do it by yourself. I, I personally, you can ask Miku, I don't do anything by myself. Like I, I have help in everything I do, right? And so nobody does anything by themselves. And so the thing is to have humility and ask for help, right? So I was very um, sort of uh, uh, attentive to ask my parents and my in-laws, look, I'm gonna need help with, with your grandchildren. Do you think you can help me? You have to ask, right? And don't make assumptions. You should always ask. And, um, and so I think, I think it's about building that circle of support around you. So I have very supportive clinical partners. My two neurosurgical partners are highly supportive. If I tell them I've been invited to give a talk at ACR, they're like, no problem, go, I'll cover the call around those dates. It's important you give that talk. You know? And then similarly on the research side, having very supportive people who understand I can't make lab meeting because I have an emergency surgery, right? So making sure you build that web of support where there's an understanding of good faith that um, if you're not somewhere, it's because you're in the other place. People always know where you are and, and they're always there to help you with, with all aspects of your work and your, and your personal life as well. So I think that's probably the best advice. Thank you so much. Did they go ahead? Oh, I think you're, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think it's good. So uh, thank you, Dr. Shira, for the presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. I just had a, a small question. I was wondering, uh, you said uh, the goal was to, with your patient was to understand the end goal. And knowing that uh, developing a treatment takes a lot of time and that the GBMs mutates a lot. Mm -hmm. If we understand the end goal, the time for us to create a new uh, treatment, the GBM has already mutated. So we're always going to be one or two steps behind the GBMs. So if we understand the end goal, what does it look like to be one step further? Is it understanding how to slow prevent the GBMs mutations? What are the options and the solution? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Devin. And the only way that we can piece together how important any drivers are that we discover is first of all, you have to unearth the new biology. And then you have to test the hypothesis of how important that is as a driver, right? And again, it comes back to what I said about just because something is expressed, it doesn't mean that it's functionally important. So for example, if from Cindy's um, wonderful and generous donation, we uncover new biology that we haven't seen before in GBM, the goal would be to go back to the lab and to model that again and find out are some of the new targets we discovered there, 
are they sufficient to drive a GBM to escape therapies further? And if so, then how can we understand how to block that? So I think it's about modeling. You're right. The GBM is always going to be a few steps ahead of us. But at some point, we may be able to uncover for one particular patient, what is their Achilles heel? What is the thing that it will eventually slow that tumor to grind it to a halt, right? And the only way we can do that is to understand, first of all, what are those drivers? Are they essential? Are they functionally important? And then if they are, how do we block them, right? And again, in terms of therapy development, I think everything has to be done in a rational and data-driven way. So we have to figure out, um, you know, not only uh, give the therapy, but how is the patient responding to the therapy? So I'll give you a little hint that I spoke to a very large venture capital, big pharma firm in Switzerland that was speaking to me this morning. And I told them that I think the next cutting edge thing for uh, delivery of immunotherapies is that we are going to deliver them local regionally into the brain. And there's many trials right now where we place what we call an OMIA reservoir, a ventricular reservoir into the CSF space in the brain and we deliver the therapies right there. So guess what that also permits? If you think about it, not just delivery, you can also survey the CSF. So I can put in a therapy like a CD133 targeting NK cell, and then I can a day later withdraw CSF and figure out what's happening. What are my cells doing? What's the GBM doing? Is the GBM now sending new signals? What's happening? So it's about that kind of dynamic. Cancer is dynamic. So we have to develop ways of surveillance that are dynamic. And then that could instruct us as to how to better deliver the therapies, both in a metronomic fashion, like when should we deliver a therapy? Oh, this one's not working anymore. Quick, now we need to give another dose. You know, we have to be more responsive in that way. I find with GBM, we've had one therapy, we just give it. And then when there's no other options, we don't know what to do, right? So it's just maybe we need to be more proactive. Thank you for the response. I had one last question, but I think Simone, you can go ahead. You can go ahead, I'll go after. Okay, fine. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Shing, Dr. Shing for your answer. And I was also wondering, uh, you talked about the spatial uh, heterogeneity. I'm not sure if I missed that part, but let's say if you have a model for, for the surgeon to extract the tumor at some places, how confident can you rely on the model knowing that all GBMs are different? Because if spatially they're all different, taken at some point, you might miss a lot of places. So how large of a sample do you need to be confident in this, the, um, the genetic analysis you have? Yeah, that's another great question, Devane. And I think you're obviously realizing the full complexity, right? And I can see that you're overwhelmed by GBM like I am too, right? Like, oh my God, there's so many different levels and layers, right? So my advice and what I'm trying to do is you have to try to work through it systematically, right? So at this point in time, we've never even studied a whole GBM. I haven't yet seen a paper that profiles the entire GBM and studies all the different regions of it. So maybe we start with that first. And the best way to get a whole GBM is from the, an autopsy setting because we can never get that in life. But this is the interesting thing. One idea leads to another. So just like you're thinking, my neurosurgeon team, the one that I showed you pictures of, um, what they did is they actually said, hey, this is so cool how much information we're getting from the autopsy. Let's do this in live patients as well. So in patients who have suitable GBMs that are large localized temporal masses, my neurosurgeons at the general have started a new on-block resection protocol. So now they're removing the GBM rather than just sucking it out with the suction or using the Cavitron and just you know, going crazy. They're actually removing the GBM as a whole piece then they're flagging it and annotating it, and then they're sectioning it, and we're able to profile it. We correlate it with the MRI as well, and then we can, we can study it in the same way as we're doing the autopsies, but now this is a live patient, right? So they're thinking about the ways that we're using for the autopsy, and now they're finding ways to apply it to live patients. So I think you have to move in a stepwise fashion. You know, you just, first you figure out what is, what is it we don't know, try to answer the immediate need, and then you just keep building on that. And fortunately, you guys are young. Maybe you can study something for 25 years and then keep going with all the steps, right? Thank you for the answer. And sorry if I mispronounced your name previously. Not at all. Thank you, Devin. Saman. 
I'm just waiting in case anyone else is okay. Pretty quick question. So, because you did your PhD at Toronto, there's a certain scientist training program to protect the time off. Uh, what advice would you have for someone that wants to do a PhD in basic sciences and neurosurgery residency? Like, what are the key things that a medical student should be able to be competent to uh, begin PhD studies later in residency? Is it like RNA seq? Is it more like data analysis? Is it like what? What advice would you give in in GBM? So. You know, I think that all of you are eminently trainable people. Like you've already demonstrated that from your, you know, academic paths to date. So I think a lot of it is the aptitudes that you already have to be, you know, a successful medical student will set you up for being successful in further study. As long as you have the drive and as long as you have the enthusiasm and the work ethic, which undoubtedly you do, right? Then I think the most important thing is to study something that you're passionate about and that you're interested in, which is, you know, correlated with better success. But the other important thing is um, to make sure that you have really good time management and organizational skills, because that's something that's really required to be able to, to balance multiple things at once. And it's not, I'm not talking so much about multitasking because we all multitask, but sometimes that's just doing a million things superficially, right? It's more about actually being able to understand how to set aside blocks of time and make that time really productive and useful and um, how to kind of build your time out in a logical and organized way. So having really good time management and organizational skills is super important. But I think as long as you have the interest and drive, I have had students that have come in with zero biochemical knowledge, but they're dedicated to solving a problem. And by the end of their PhDs, they're experts. So I think if you're dedicated to becoming an expert, then you just, it's like diving into cold water. Like you just dive in head first and you get in there and it's just like neurosurgery, right? Like you, you just, you work as hard as you can and gain as much as you can. So I don't think it's so much about coming in with pre-existing skill sets. You don't have to be like a computer genius to become a biocomputational expert. You just have to have, um, uh, a, a sort of a, a talent or a predilection for something maybe you recognize in yourself and then build on that. Very helpful answer. Thank you. Any more question? That's the last question, maybe. Okay. If not, so I want to just thank you and thank Dr. Singh again for a great lecture. That was definitely one of the most informative lectures we had in, in CAMSAN. You learned a lot from both scientific perspective and also from the mentorship perspective. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And I'm pretty sure everyone in the lecture enjoyed the same. Um, so thank you everyone else for joining us as well. And uh, so we just recorded the, the, the meeting. I know that this is like a full of information. Uh, personally, I want to watch this again to, and learn all the details of the talk. So we will post the, the recording of the video soon in, in the next few days uh, on our um, website and also on the Twitter. Uh, so make sure to check it out if you want to uh, listen to the recording again. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. <laughs>